People have lived and died by the bow for at least the last 10,000 years, probably much longer. For such an old art, it's surprising how many new frontiers there are to explore. As a bowmaker, it's always fun to find a new one. Crossbows have had repeating magazines for a very long time, but for archery bows, they're a new feature. Repeating arrow magazines for bows. What role would they have played in archery's history? What about its future? A few years ago, George Sprav invented this device, and since then he's taken it from the medieval to the modern. There's even a version called the Fenris that you can fit to a modern compound bow. That's the absolute cutting edge in repeating bow technology, and that's the way you should go if you want peak performance. But if you want to make it yourself with simple tools, this is the Cupid Repeater. Let me show you its features. There are multiple ways to shoot the device that give you variable firing speed and power. We're gonna call this pump mode, which gives you the most firing speed, but only up to about 80% of total power. In full power mode, you can brace the full draw weight of the bow against the device. This makes the device sort of like a crossbow in this mode, although technically it still isn't one. So here's our bow, here's our repeater. You open it like so, slide it onto the string, close it. You add the optional safety pin, then you're free to load up the bolts. Now I'm using these Cobra crossbow pistol bolts. The device takes six. In the event of a jam, you can clear your bolts through this hole here. In the event of a serious jam, you can take the whole thing apart relatively quickly. Here's the bow we're using. You can swap out any bow, but I designed the specs around this particular device to this individual bow. This is a little Cupid's bow from a hickory sapling, and it draws around 20, 25 pounds at 24 inches. I've only been using this repeater with lightweight bows and bolts that aren't that serious. I consider these Cobra crossbow pistol bolts to be somewhat recreational. If you want to make a version that you can use with heavy duty bows and arrows, I'll still walk you through that and the process is pretty much the same. The major difference is that I think you should fit a serious version with longer arrows. I'll explain the reasoning behind that later, but that will allow you to use a magazine spring and an automatic trigger for more firing speed and heavier projectile. You can see that these Cobra Crossbow pistol bolts just don't carry the same energy as a real arrow. All right, on to the build. Here's the board we're starting with. It's 12 feet of red oak dimensional lumber one and a half by three quarters inches. It's not strictly important that you have the same dimensions. The board needs to be thicker than the veins on your bolts and needs to be wide enough to be sturdy. We're gonna cut the board into four pieces and stack them together. And that's gonna be the core of our repeater. The length you're gonna want is just about your draw length plus four to six inches, depending what kind of handle and trigger mechanism you wanna use. I'm only showing you the way that I built this device, but I strongly recommend that you customize it to your personal needs. Do you see how stacking four pipes like this gives you a little barrel in the middle? Well, that gave me an idea. I thought, what if I take four slabs of wood and round the corners, then when I glue them together, I'll basically have a barrel. I think that this construction method, at least for the tools that I use, really simplified the build and makes the device more accessible to your average home workshop. I rounded the corners to about the same radius as the bolts I'm using, but ultimately it's going to depend on what projectiles you choose and the size of your string, so you may have to play around with that to get a good fit. Now it's time to carve the magazine and match it to the specs of our projectiles. This is much easier to do with the two pieces of wood glued together construction. 
You can build this whole device out of just two pieces of wood rather than four, but butterflying the magazine and making it in two halves makes it much easier to carve. I'm using the carving tools that I like. You should use the ones that you do. There's no reason you need to use a draw knife or chisels or any other tool for that matter. You could even cut this out on a bandsaw. If you're not very confident in your tool use, I would do this with uh, files and rasps, something like a Shinto rasp. Same goes, by the way, when you round the corners to make the barrel slot. There's no reason you have to use a spokeshave like I did. Even sandpaper will work, or just rasps and files. Most of the time I use a bevel up draw knife, but when I want to carve a tighter radius I'll switch to a bevel down. To find the final fit between the boards and the bolts, I'm using a Shinto saw rasp. And then I'll go ahead and carve the other side to match. Make sure you get a good test fit, find the spots that are snagging, and rasp them down. Alright, so we have the bolts fitting the magazine pretty smoothly, but there is one issue with using the Cobra Crossbow Pistol bolts that I'll try to explain by showing you some of the devices and prototypes that I made while I was trying to figure out this design. This is a Mahara, known as the Tonga in Korea. This is a device that allows you to shoot short arrows from long bows. Without the device, I'd be at risk of shooting myself in the hand. And basically, this half of the device is a tonga. There's also a trigger and a magazine. Now we have a repeating device. Now you might recognize this bow. It's a 1 scale miniature war bow made from juniper that I made for a video a little while back. And I made this little repeating crossbow out of pencils to shoot toothpicks. This one takes these, uh, the tips of these arrows that have broken. I've just been saving them. And they fit in there. But the prototype's really simple. It's just uh, two pieces of wood capped on the end. And each one has a half moon barrel. Plus there's a bamboo magazine spring. Very simple. The problem with this device, which is that every time you draw the string back, you're gonna to have to get past the point. You don't want the point jamming into your string. I use these just because I wanted to. I've always wanted to shoot them out of a bow with a full power stroke and haven't been able to. The trouble though is after you shoot one, the string will have to get past the point on the next bolt. So you can't use a magazine spring just like you would use with these. If you use longer arrows, this is not a problem because see how the, the point of the arrow is already past the string? So it's much easier to build this device for longer arrows. You shoot an arrow and then the string is already past the point. You can use broadheads, you can use sharpened points, whatever you want. So the fatal flaw of this design is that with these tiny bolts, I can't use sharp ones. So the way I've gotten around that problem in the version we're making today is with a little well-placed magnet that holds the tip of the bolt back so the string can slide freely without getting caught on the sharp edge. Now for this to work, I had to get rid of the magazine spring constantly pushing on the bolts. Instead what you do is just shove your finger in there and push the next bolt in. Works really well. But when you do this at home, you don't need the magnet and you don't need to use a bolt action system if you use 
longer arrows. Let me just jump in for a sec to clarify what I mean when I say longer arrows. I'm not saying full length archery arrows that are longer than the draw length of the bow. What I mean is arrows that are longer than the power stroke of the bow. So you'll see devices like the instant Legolini that use the Cobra crossbow pistol bolts without this issue. And it's not a problem because the bolts are longer than the power stroke of that tiny bow. The next prototype has the same design flaw. I'm using similar Cobra pistol bolts, but these have to be rounded over so that the string can get past them without getting stuck. This is a lot like the version we're building today. The only difference is it has a magazine spring. Now let's install that magnet that I was talking about, the one in the magazine. You don't want to install it all the way at the bottom of the magazine so it's actually touching the barrel, but you need to leave a little bit of a gap. That way the magnet pulls the bolts away from the barrel so the string doesn't catch on the point, and so that you actually have to click them down into the barrel for them to fire. Next I smoothed out the transition between the magazine and the barrel to give the bolts the best chance to escape the magazine cleanly and also to reduce the chance of a misfire. One more time, the magnet is not strictly necessary, it's just a quirk for using the particular ammo that I used. If you're making a heavy duty version, you want longer arrows and you won't need the magnet, but you'll use a magazine spring instead. Now let's make the trigger. I made this out of a scrap piece of one inch PVC pipe that I heated on the end and flattened. You could make your trigger out of wood, but you might have issues with fiber direction and may need to reinforce the part that engages the string. For an example of how to do that, in the description of the video I'll put a link to the slingshot channel built along of the instant Genghis. You'll see in that device that there's actually no trigger, so you don't strictly need one. There's a lot of flexibility about where you put your trigger and what shape you make it, and it depends on how you intend to use your device. Sometime or another, I'd like to do a fully medieval version of this build with more time accurate projectiles. And in that case, I think I'll use an antler trigger. Since I'm not using a very heavy bow, I didn't bother to center this trigger in the string slot. But if you're using a very heavy bow, you may need to make some design modifications so that the trigger axle is exactly aligned with the string slot. That way you can have a lighter trigger pull. Next I drilled out a hole for the trigger axle and a guide hole in the trigger sear. Here you can see what I mean about the trigger axle not exactly being aligned with the sear. Again, if you want a lighter trigger pull, you need to make the axle exactly aligned with the string slot. It's better to err on the side of leaving the trigger sear a little bit oversized for now. That way you can fiddle with it later and make sure you get a good fit. Right now the hook is a little bit too sharp and would snag on the string. I glued together the inside of the trigger with super glue, but I guess you should use PVC cement. I don't think this step is strictly necessary. Here's a quick example of an alternative trigger design. You really do have a lot of freedom about where you put it on the device and what shape you make it. The notch on the back of the second trigger so that you can attach an optional rubber band. So now we'll cut a small groove in the trigger we're making for the same function. In the end I like the device more without the rubber band, but if you like the feel of a returning trigger, it's a good idea. Now I'm marking out the position of the trigger sear mechanism. Notice that the hook of the trigger sear extends a little bit past the string slot and fits into a little tiny groove on the other side. Mark out the maximum forward position of the trigger and then pull it until the sear clears the string slot and then mark the maximum rear position.
Now let's carve that little groove that mates with the hook of the triggers here. The line on the side of the board represents the thickness of the trigger. If you have a different type of pipe, you can still make a trigger out of it. You'll just have to carve to a slightly different depth. If you're not that into chiseling, then a good alternative tool would be a router or a Dremel. This is a good point to mention once again that in this design for simplicity, I made the trigger axle off to the side. It's not actually centered in the string slot. If you're going to shoot heavy bows out of this, you will want a centered trigger axle because that's going to make your trigger pull a little bit lighter. By putting it off to the side, I'm making a trade-off of a heavier trigger pull just for convenience. Since the string slot is a negative space, I don't have anywhere to drill into it. So if I wanted to put the axle through the string slot, I would have to add an underlay or an overlay that I could drill into. This wouldn't be a complicated design change. I just didn't do it for simplicity and because it's not necessary with lighter bows. Now let's get that axle hole drilled out and hopefully we don't make too much of a mess of it. Well, that wasn't square, but good enough. Now I'm carving the other side of the trigger housing, the one that goes on the magazine side of the device. This is just a negative space that lets the trigger move freely, and it offers a hard boundary for the forwardmost and rearmost trigger positions. An easier way to carve this part would be to plane the whole end down to that line I'm carving to, and then add back the hard stops, rather than carving away the negative space. Now as I do this, you're gonna see me blow through one of the sides accidentally. There, that was the accident. Now I'm gonna clean up the scene of the crime with a draw knife and glue on a replacement piece. Here's our little repair piece. Let's set the super glue with some pressure from a vise. You can see that it hasn't been long and I've already broken a little chip off the repair piece. So it probably would have been a good idea to glue it on with a different fiber direction or use another material. Once again, I prefer the device without a rubber band on the trigger, but it adds the nice returning trigger feature and makes it so that you don't have to reset the trigger after every shot. Alternatively, you could use a spring loaded trigger this is something that Jörg Sprav has done on many of his slingshot channel builds. Now that we have the guts of the device carved out, we can begin to join the quarters into halves. Now I'm gluing the two boards that make up the barrel portion of the device. I could have glued the magazine side as well, but I decided to screw it together just in case I had to take it apart. I ended up not having to do this and it would have been fine to glue it. If down the line you need to tinker inside of the magazine, it's going to be much easier if you can take it apart. Now that everything's all carved out, I can show you how the magazine works. Obviously, I don't have a bow attached, so I'm just going to jack the bolts manually through the string slot. Next, we'll make the string slot itself, which is just the negative space that allows the string to slide freely throughout the power stroke of the bow. And we'll do that by making some spacers. Make them oversized at first, about as wide as your string or a little bit wider. Remember that the string can collapse a little bit through the string slot without causing too much friction, especially with paracord. If you leave this too loose, you could have a wobbly projectile, and in the worst case, the bolt could escape the barrel and actually hit you in the hand. For me, the string slot is the hardest part of the whole device to get right. In Jorg's build-alongs, he tends to saw it out out of thin plywood or laminates. For me, this is very difficult, and I had an easier time assembling the barrel from both sides. It's hard to get the sides of the string slot smooth, but this is taken care of automatically if you just use the sides of the board. And create the space by using spacers. There are three spacers total, a wide one in the back and two narrower ones in the front. Keep the front ones narrow and wide enough apart so that the bolt can still fit between them 
with a little bit of room to spare. I glued the spacers to the barrel half of the device, and not the magazine side, but it doesn't matter, you could put them on either side. After cleaning up the edges with a draw knife, I widened up the mouths of both sides of the barrel, just to give the bolts a clean escape. After that's done, I'll drill the access hole in the magazine, that way you can clear jams quickly. After you get the device working smoothly, you won't see many gems, but at first, and especially if you forget to load a bolt before you fire, there's a good chance the device could jam. When you forget to load a bolt before you fire, about half the time the bow will jam the bolt into the magazine, and about half the time the bow will dry fire. As a quick solution for jams, I'll drill an easy access hole into the magazine, that way you can clear obstructed bolts. When you're making and setting up the repeater, you might dry fire your bow a few times, so you really don't want to use a nice bow. If you don't have a bow you don't mind messing around with, on the channel I have a 3 minute tutorial for a PVC horse bow. That bow draws 40 pounds at 28 inches, which might be a little much for these Cobra pistol bolts, but at the 24 inch draw of this device, it's a really nice amount of power. Each half of the device is fully functional now, except for optional accessories that you can add for different firing modes. Except, we still don't have a way to attach the two halves of the device, so what we'll do is add these side flaps, and they'll allow us to quickly pin the two halves together. As an alternative, you could screw the two halves together with end caps, like I did on some of my prototypes. The problem with this is that you lose the quick attach functionality, which I found really handy. Right now the flaps are just super glued, but later on I dowel pegged them at an angle, so they'd be more sturdy. The safety pin that goes in the front of the device is just made from a normal bolt, and it's had the edge rounded, that's all. To make the pin that goes in the back, I used the shaft from a broken bolt, and I flared the side out with a drill. Alright, we have the two halves pinned, and the quick release function works. Now I'm going to cut a big groove into the barrel side of the device. This is for full power mode, it's a spot for the bow to click into when you draw the bow all the way back. It also serves as an attachment point for accessories that give you different firing options, different rates of fire, whatever you want. You have to ask yourself what your repeater is for. As a bow maker, I'm never going to use this as my main form of archery. I just wanted a cool and dangerous toy. So that's why I used recreational ammo and never made a high power version. It just wouldn't be as fun to be honest. But if you do want to use this for accurate archery, there are a lot of ways to improve the device. And you can add those to this attachment point. For example, you can see that in Jorg's more modern iterations of the device, there's a rack system that the magazine device slides through. Great feature, but it does cost you some bulk and mobility. That's why in this fun version I didn't include one. Personally, I have more fun with a freestyle device. This next step is completely optional. I just drilled and pegged some holes so that I would have a place to attach a rubber band. Again, I like the device more without a rubber band. It just gives you a returning trigger that you don't have to reset every time you fire. But since I put the trigger so close to the magazine, it's hardly any trouble. This piece I'm making is a little stop lock for the bolts, just to keep them from popping out of the magazine. I think I put it a little bit too forward of center, and it would have worked better closer to the center of gravity of the bolts. And we're ready to shoot. I'm just going to cut off this corner and round it off so the device is a little more comfortable to test. I'm going to do the first test shots at half draw, which I'm guessing is around 30% of total power. And it works. 
Up to 80% draw now. In freestyle shooting modes without a handle, the device is a little bit hard to balance. You have to get used to it. Of course, you can add a rack system so that the bow slides accurately. I'm just gonna add a quick PVC handle, which gives the same functionality as an arrow shelf. If you forget to load a bolt before you fire, that either leads to a jam or a dry fire. Here's a jam so you can see how handy that little access hole is. Time for full power. In this mode, the device takes on the draw weight of the bow, so you don't have to keep holding it. But you still have to keep the bow balanced. This is much, much safer if you strap the bow to the device. But that sacrifices a lot of the freestyle aspect, and makes the whole device much more cumbersome. The rate of fire is much slower in full power mode, but you get the most range, power, and accuracy. So why do I shoot on the wrong side of the bow? It's actually for safety. Just in case an arrow escapes, I don't have my wrist under the string slot. You see how the string slot goes over my wrist? But over on this side, really only your thumb is in danger, and not really if you keep it out of the way. So we're pretty much done with the bulk of the repeater. There are just a few crumbs of work left to do. So now you're free to carve the device, get rid of all the edges, and customize the way it looks. Just don't shave off so much wood that you change how the device flexes. When I first set out to build a magazine repeater, I was very, very skeptical about the historical potential of this device because of the durability of natural material strings. If you talk to many modern primitive bowyers, you'll find a lot of them, myself included, who make bows out of all natural materials, but still use modern synthetic strings. When you have a string break and it takes your bow with it, that will radically change your views on using authentic strings. So I do fiddle around with natural material strings sometimes, but they break your heart with how quickly they wear out. And using a string like that in a device like this will only make it wear out quicker. I still have my doubts about string durability as far as military devices go. But with this recreational version, I was actually using a natural linen string on the Cupid bow. I made that string with a good protective serving layer and it's actually been holding up really, really well. So this has made me much more optimistic on this question of string durability. But I still think it's a major issue because string durability is a major issue on historical bows anyway. And in a device like this, it's only gonna be worse. So my gut feeling about the historical role of this device is that it would have been a luxury item for rich people. So I'd say I really agree with Todd of Todd's Workshop on this point. But I'm keeping an open mind, and I would love for there to be hidden potential in this device that I'm not seeing. It's not as if this technology was unavailable in medieval times. So the question is, why didn't they exist? If you look at historical bows, they don't even have an arrow shelf, which is a luxury many modern archers take for granted. So that makes me wonder, if medieval bowyers were too practical for an arrow shelf, I think they were too practical for all these complications. And the natural step forward from the bow was the crossbow, not the repeating bow. If you have a look at the English longbow design, what makes it so favorable in a military context isn't that it's a superior bow design, but that it's an excellent military system for getting the most weaponry possible out of the minimum resources. That's the opposite of what this device is. It takes a lot of labor to make one weapon. Now, I don't know if that would be true for every military culture in history. It's just my gut feeling as a bowmaker. In traditional archery circles, repeating arrow magazines have been a little controversial, not unlike how compound bows were when they were introduced. But now that's a respected Olympic category. I don't see exactly that happening with this device, because rate of fire is simply not valued in competitive archery. And I don't particularly see that changing in the future. Archery range owners really don't like high rates of fire, just because it ruins their targets quickly. So I think the reason these devices probably never existed is just there hasn't been a direct need for them. Until now. And that's entertainment. These things are fun as hell. I would love to start seeing these in video games and pop culture, and for there to be as wide a variety of repeating magazine devices as there are with bows and crossbows. So even though I may be abandoning my traditional roots to say this, 
I think these devices are awesome. And thank you, Yorg, for sharing your invention with the world. Before I call it done, I'm just going to do a little bit of adjusting on the hook of the triggers here, just to make the trigger pull a little bit lighter. And if you remember that little piece that I broke, now I'm going to replace it with a dowel. The purpose of the lip of that piece, or of the dowel, is to offer a hard stop that doesn't let the bolt slide backwards and jam up the trigger mechanism. But you still need to leave enough room that the string can clear that gap and reach the trigger. To start with, I left the dowel a little bit oversized, and then I worked it down with files, just until it was the perfect size to stop the bolts, but not the string from sliding back. There's one part missing, which is the handle attachment. I haven't been using it because with lightweight bows, it's actually relatively easy to hold the device by friction. But if you want to use a heavier draw weight, you're going to want a proper handle. I like one on the side because it keeps your hand away from the string slot. Jorg has one that works um, in line with the bow. That's fine too. Now I'm gluing this with super glue, but you should probably do this with uh, contact adhesive. Okay, here's how our piece of PVC looks after molding it around the bow handle. You open it up and you just snap it on. It's not pretty, but it works. Now the minute the video's over, I'll be taking this off. Um, I only made this to show you how and so the device can be used in full power mode without feeling dangerous. So now you can draw the bow sort of like it's a slingshot. All right then, time for finishing, but first we're gonna have to endure some sanding. First I did a pass with 220 grit, and then after wetting down the fibers, I did another with 320. Finally, I finished all the wood with a few layers of tongue oil. Magazine repeaters don't have the benefit of 10,000 years of innovation like bows do. That's going to be up to you. So take what you like about my build, improve upon its flaws. Take the elements you like from Jorg's and Todd's and build your own version to suit your own needs. So there it is, folks. We're all done. There's a whole world of archery and a million ways to explore it. So, bows, 
or magazine repeaters? I can only give you a biased answer. I'm a bowyer. My dream in life is to make a living making living bows from living trees. That's my archery journey. I'll teach you everything I learn along the way. Will you come with me? Let's go make some bows.